Welcome to the 2020 Global Peace Film Festival interview. My name is Kelly Devine. I'm the Artistic Director. Please join me and Nina Strike, the Executive Director, as we interview Abby Ginsberg with the film Waging Change. You can find out information about Waging Change on our festival website, peacefilmfest.org. Remember, the festival begins September 21st and runs through October 4th. Tickets are already on sale, so please come to the website, check out the watch tab, and look for information about Abby Ginsberg's film, Waging Change, and all other events that are happening during the Global Peace Film Festival. And now, let's start the interview. Well, hello, Abby, and it's wonderful to have you with us. Let's start by uh, asking you to tell us a little bit about your film. So usually, the, I'm going to answer the question that most people, you know, have, which is, how did you come to make this film? And because there's a story there. I was at a luncheon somewhere in the Bay Area, and I heard Saru Jayaraman speak. She's featured in the film. And what I learned from her, this is really back in, you know, 2015, is that the tipped minimum wage for restaurant workers is still, and it was true in 2015, and it's still true today, is still $2.13 in many, many states in this country. And I practically fell off my chair because I, you know, I come from a state where they force restaurants to pay full minimum wage, which can be up to $15 plus tips. So it never occurred to me that there are places in the country where people are making two thirteen dollars and have to take $5, $6, $7 of their tips just to get themselves to minimum wage. Sorry about that. Um, and so I just, I got hooked on the idea that if I didn't know about this, and I think of myself as relatively well-educated on labor issues, how many more thousands and millions of people had no idea that there was such a thing as a tip minimum wage? And I just sort of slowly but surely had that feeling in my, you know, my stomach and my hands get clammy and I'm like, oh my God, here we go. Here goes five years of my life into this subject. And you basically, if you're a documentary filmmaker, have to be ready to commit that kind of time because between raising the money and finding the story and going through all the iterations of what happens when the story doesn't turn out exactly the way you think it will, which is what happened here, you know, you do spend five years of your life on it. So that's exactly what happened. And then I needed to get, but essentially, you know, I had to introduce myself to these people and say, I'm interested in making a film. And they had to sort of check me out and decide whether or not I seemed like a worthy person to you know, partner with. And that takes time. So that I, I'm sort of giving you a couple of things about how documentary filmmakers end up taking a deep dive if they're not, if someone doesn't come to them and say, would you make a film about X and here's the money. You find the subject, you then find the characters. You then figure out how you're gonna raise close to half a million dollars. And, and then you start working with no idea of how long it's going to be before you have a story that's really going to work. I mean, something like this was completely unscripted. I was following both individual workers and stories that were taking place in cities across the country. So the film follows a, you know, a ballot initiative in Washington, D.C. that we had every reason to believe was going to be successful until it wasn't. And a ballot initiative in Michigan that we had every reason to believe would be successful until it wasn't. And what we didn't anticipate was how sort of outrageous the behavior of the opposition was going to be. I mean, the organizers of the campaigns knew that there would be people fighting against these ballot initiatives. They did not foresee, nor did I, that the D.C. City Council, after the ballot initiative passed, would repeal it, nor did they see that in Michigan, where there was an increase in the minimum wage ballot initiative that was headed to the ballot, that the Michigan legislature, which was run by Republicans, would vote in the changes that the ballot initiative was geared towards, and then in a lame duck section, also repeal it. So we were, you know, stunned in two different situations by essentially really dirty tricks by the opposition. Um, and that just meant that, you know, the film continued for another year. So, and this is typical. You know, some of the best documentaries are made following a story that you think, as I say, is going to have one outcome and has a different one. So the film 
I was able, let me say this, I was able to end the film when the House of Representatives finally passed, you know, an end to the tip minimum wage. Now, just the House passing, it doesn't mean that that's law in the United States. So the House passed it, but we're still waiting for the Senate to act. And hello, we're headed into an election where if we flip the Senate and it turns Democratic, there is a really good chance that we'll get, you know, new law in Congress. But since 1991, the situation is that the tip minimum wage in 17 states is $2.13 and in 43 states total is, you know, maybe between $2.13 and about $5. So it's a, it's a disgrace and it is a legacy of slavery and it is a story that I really want people to know. So no matter where you live, all you have to do is Google what is the tip minimum wage in my state and then Google what is the minimum wage in my state, and you'll find out in about a half a second whether or not you're in a tip minimum wage state and how much workers are getting paid. And what I want, you know, restaurant goers, assuming we're gonna be going back to restaurants to know is what is the situation for your restaurant server, your nail salon worker, your car park attendant. I mean, you wanna know who are the tip minimum wage workers in your state, and you want to tip generously if they are ever working for you. And something that wasn't in your documentary, uh, because you had stopped filming before COVID hit, is that the legacy of that $2.13 um, you know, wage is that many of those people, once they were out on the streets uh, because of the lockdown, Pandemic. were not eligible to even collect unemployment? Well, I, again, I, you know, the film was released before the pandemic. So there is a lot to say about what has happened in the whole field since the pandemic hit. So your point is the first one, which is that if you are only, you know, if your wages are reported at the 213 level, you are below the floor of many states that require you that you make a certain amount of money a month in order to qualify for unemployment. So that's the first thing. So many of these workers who were totally out of work and should have qualified ended up not being able to get unemployment because their wages were too low. So this is a double whammy that the pandemic revealed. So that was number one. And you know, and restaurant owners, I think, I, since nobody foresaw the pandemic being a total shutdown for restaurants, many restaurant owners were upset that their workers were in such a bad way. They wanted their workers to get unemployment. So the fact that this was a double hit to them was really outrageous. I mean, and the employers, many of them have sort of rethought what they're gonna do about the one fair wage question since the pandemic. So the next thing that happened was, now you have all these laid off restaurant workers with no access to unemployment. The group that I follow in the film called One Fair Wage, ended up doing a really good job of raising a lot of money, but the need was so great that they can't meet all the needs. So they raised over $20 million, which is a big sum of money in this moment. And they had over 220,000 workers apply for the funds. Well, if you do the math, it comes out to under $500 per person. So that was a mess. And so there is still a need when you say, you know, what else can people do? I just, one thing I'd like to do is do a shout out to something called the One Fair Wage Emergency Fund. Because if after watching the movie, people are motivated to say, where can I donate? This is where you can donate. So it's www.ofwemergencyfund.org. Um, and so if, you know, if, somebody can do that, um, please think about going to the, you know, to the One Fair Wage Emergency Fund. Um, uh, so anyway, that, that's, so that is one big um, impact of the pandemic. There's another one that's been interesting, which is that more and more restaurant owners have really kind of come to the table and realized that the old model was sort of unsustainable. And they are now looking to join with One Fair Wage. And the states, or at least New York and DC, are offering some very good incentives so that if a restaurant owner that was totally you know, paying the, min the tip minimum wage comes to the table and says, we will pay One Fair Wage moving forward, they can get access to millions of dollars of loans that will enable them to reopen. So there is a new list of over 100 restaurants, both in New York and in DC, 
where who are availing themselves of this and who, as I say, are kind of going to turn themselves into one fair wage restaurants, even though pre-pandemic they were not in favor of it. So that's a whole other thing. Um, so anyway, there's been some good movement. And then the third thing I want to bring to people's attention is that there have been strikes both in New York uh, State or New York City, actually, and Chicago, where workers are refusing to go back to work because the conditions are so bad um, and where they have to be, quote, mask enforcers. And, you know, they're not being paid because their tips are down now. And, you know, now everybody's sort of turned into a takeout. And so, you know, people leave a couple of dollars instead of 20 percent. So there, this is another way of, you know, kind of organizing to call attention to the situation that workers are facing right now. Um, and so just, you know, I want people to keep their ears open. All this is happening in real time in the last couple of weeks. And so my film, you know, having been done a few months ago, doesn't cover this. But if you, once you know about the story, then you start seeing other stories that relate to it. And, and what I would say is I was drawn to this story in part because it was a story of worker empowerment. And I would say post-pandemic, it is even more so a story of worker empowerment. And so, you know, I would urge people to sort of find out what's going on in your own state and to support efforts that are going on locally, you know, to bring about change on this issue of the tip minimum wage. Associated with many films that we've programmed are what they call impact campaigns that have direct calls to action. Um, you've already mentioned supporting One Fair Wage, and you've mentioned certainly, you know, using the film to educate yourself about your community. Are there any other calls to action that you would recommend? Well, there are, but yet the, I, I have to send you back to the One Fair Wage website. I mean, okay. I need this film to, you know, have it work in conjunction with things that were going on on the ground. So again, because we do not have the capacity to have a national bill at this point until, as I say, we get a Democratic Senate. Um, what's happening is happening at the state level. So there are bills that are moving in Illinois, in Massachusetts, in Pennsylvania, I'm just thinking, and in New York. So in New York, Cuomo did a sort of outrageous thing, which is he eliminated the tip minimum wage for all workers but restaurant workers. So all Cuomo has to do is sign an executive order to change that and to include restaurant workers in his ending of the tip minimum wage. He is, I feel like he's gonna fall over and come to our side on this eventually. So what I would recommend people do is you go to, it's www.onefairwage.com because it involves political action, not donations. And um, check on the state strategies. There is a state link on that website. And maybe if there's some way for you to link to these things, I'll send them to you. But anyhow, www.onefairwage.com slash states, and you will see if you're from Massachusetts, who do you write to? If you're from Illinois, who do you write to? And if you're from New York, you write to Cuomo. And anybody from any state can do any of these campaigns, can join these campaigns and sort of help make their voices heard. Because one of the things you want is to make sure that more states join the seven Western states that have already eliminated the tip minimum wage. I mean, in California, we haven't had a tip minimum wage for 20 years, and we have some of the highest rates of tipping in the country. So it isn't that you get rid of the tip minimum wage and then everybody stops tipping. That is not what happens. Because in California, as I say, we're very generous about tipping. So, so anyway, go to that website, check out the state campaigns, and if you don't live in a state where one of these campaigns is actively taking place, think of what you can do in terms of sending a postcard, making a phone call, and supporting one of the other campaigns. And, and the one last thing that, that I've drawn out of listening to you is the importance of voting as well. Oh Hopefully my God. State, federal, right? Absolutely, yes. And so, I mean, let me say that, you know, the, I mean, you have to vote like your life depended on it, the way Michelle <laughs> Obama said it. Yes, we all have to vote. And, and here is how it connects to waging change. I'm not sure the Democrats are doing everything I want them to do on making the link between how economic inequity will be treated differently by Democrats than by Republicans. So the Trump administration has moved, you see it in the film when he tries to take away people's tips. It is, you know, it is 
completely essentially opposed to the rights of working people to make a living wage. The Democrats have adopted the move for a fair living wage in three different aspects of their convention platform. So it's in their economic thing, it is in their women's platform, and it is in some other big part of their platform. I can't remember the third one. So it does matter who gets into office because as I say, not only do we need to flip the Senate, but having a president who would sign an end to a tip minimum wage bill is huge. And we could really take some steps forward in this country. I mean, it really, go I mean, if the pandemic has revealed anything, it is how economic inequity, you know, went from bad to worse under the pandemic. And what now needs to happen is we need to come together as a country and try to figure out how we are gonna, you know, kind of heal ourselves and reduce those gaps. And I have to say that, you know, the Biden-Harris campaign has adopted a one fair wage approach they will do something about the tip minimum wage. It is on their radar. You know, people are working with them every day to make sure that it's part of their economic platform and that it's something that they, you know, kind of push to the top of the platform. And it is something that we can do something about. But first, we have to vote them into office. So what's next for you? And you've already talked about how audiences can support one fair wage. Um, is there anything else that audiences can do to support your work? Well, I, again, I, I think, you know, I find it very supportive when people watch this film and tell me, oh, my God, I didn't know anything about it. I and mean, that's why I made the film, you know, to have many, many, many individuals across this country watch it and say, oh, my God, here is a disaster hiding in plain sight. And it relates to things like sexual harassment and it relates to you know, the way in which we mistreat workers all over the country, et cetera. And I didn't know about it. So for me, you support my work by watching this film and then by telling others to watch the film. And there is, you know, when this film festival is over, there'll be another film festival. It's gonna be traveling through the South on something called the Southern Circuit. And the one good thing, I mean, I have to say, I have been totally, you know, both upset and freaked out by the end of public screenings for our films. You know, the fact that we can't get together in a movie theater. But the one good thing is that now your festival, you know, has an online component and people can watch it from anywhere in the country. That has been a net plus for us, especially on an issue like this, which is a national issue and which is different in every state and, you know, requires a little bit of commitment from the viewer to figure out, well, where do they fit into the map of the United States? Um, so I've been very happy, you know, to just have one opportunity after another to share this film. And as I say, what you can do for me, per se, is if you watch the film, share the film. And, you know, the website is just www.wagingchange.com. We list all our screenings and there will be more. So if you want other people to know about this film, you just send them to the website and they can figure out where the next screening is going to be. I have another film, so I, let, me, let me just say something about that. I did a film um, that has just been completed and has been shown very erratically um, on my Congresswoman, Barbara Lee. My Congresswoman is an amazing African-American woman um, who was the lone no vote right following 9-11 when George Bush was asking for you know, authority to be able to go in and you know, use military action all around the world without the consent of Congress. So that put her on the map but she has really been a leading voice against poverty in favor of racial equity, um, a leader of the Congressional Black Caucus and, you know, and a really respected member of Congress. She is today the uh, highest level African-American woman in democratic leadership in the house. So she is somebody just like Waging Change, I want people to know about. I tend to do these stories about the sort of unheralded heroes that I know about, heroes and sheroes that I know about. And then I feel like, well, my job is to take their story and put it in a film and let the world know about these people. So Barbara Lee is somebody that I want people to know about. That film is called Truth to Power. Barbara Lee speaks for me. Um, and there is a website for it, which is called truthtopowermovie.com. And so you, you know, one of your, your viewers may be interested um, in checking out that film. It's a, you know, it's a film I'm very proud of, just like I'm proud of Waging Change, and it is a contemporary story that only gets more relevant every day. That's wonderful. I'm 
definitely going to check that film out. So thank Good. you, Abby, for mentioning Me too. And thank you, Abby, for, for taking the time to, to talk with us. This has really been uh, an invigorating discussion, and I feel really inspired just by your, you know, your enthusiasm for, for this. Um, and so thank you to everyone who's uh, watched this video. Please go to the Global Peace Film Festival website, peacefilmfest.org, to learn more about Waging Change. The festival starts September 21st, ends October 4th. Tickets are already on sale. You can learn more about Abby Ginsburg's work by going to abbyginsburg.com. Also, if there is a question that you want to ask Abby, we have provided an opportunity to do that as well. On our film pages, there is a Google form called Submit a Filmmaker Question. If you fill that out, just provide us with the film title, your question, your name, and your email, and we will get those to the filmmakers so that you can be in contact and ask those questions. We know that this pandemic has, um, has kept us from being together, but we are still trying to make sure that we can facilitate all the connections um, that, um, that really make these film festivals special for everyone. So we thank you for watching. Again, go to Peace Film Fest org for more information and we'll see you at the festival. Thank you.